Aloha, welcome to Cooper Union, what's happening with human rights around the world. I'm your host, Joshua Cooper. And today I'm Think Tech Live from downtown Honolulu, Hawaii and Wananui, Akea. Our episode is focusing on the Southern Poverty Law Center Goes Global, American Advocates Demand Dignity and Rights for All. And I'm so fortunate to be joined by Lisa Borden, Senior Policy Counsel for International Advocacy. Lisa, mahalo and thank you for joining us. No, oh, thank you for having me, Josh. It's so good to hear and share about SPLC, the Southern Poverty Law Center. And I know they stand up against racial hatred and discrimination in the US, but they're also serving as a positive catalyst for social change, justice and rights in the South and beyond. Why did SPLC decide to begin to start working more in partnership with communities across the country to dismantle discrimination and white supremacy and approach the CERB process? Well, you know, SPLC started um, in the 70s as a law firm that essentially was challenging the Klan in the southeastern U.S. But since then, it has grown in, in many directions and particularly in um, combating hate and extremism in the United States, in working for racial justice and decarceration, and, in, and more recently in working just generally to defend democracy. And so to that end, we've expanded not only from just litigation to policy work, but into federal policy work and now into international advocacy, because we just recognize that international pressure and international um, engagement is another tool that we can use to advance those very important causes. It's true. The UN Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination is an 18-member body. And what's exciting is they do review many countries, all 128 that have ratified the CERD or the ICER, the International Covenant on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination. And that review process is so important. How did Southern Poverty Law Center prepare to make sure that the world would know what's actually happening inside the borders of the U.S.? Yeah, so my, my job at Southern Poverty Law Center in international advocacy is to take the work that our advocates are doing in litigation and policy work around the Southeast and, and to raise that um, to international attention. So I'm focusing on the clients that we are representing in various um, contexts in the Southeast, on the very important policy issues that are coming out of Southeastern states where we work, and, and trying to just um, make sure that those are getting the attention of international bodies as well. And particularly for the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, um, really race runs very much through everything that we do. So we work on, uh, for example, um, litigation decarceration. We're working um, in on voting rights issues is a very big uh, part of what we're doing. And of course, hate and extremism, which is, is really growing, unfortunately, in the United States. So for us, um, the issues that the that the CERD committee is looking at uh, really touches on all of the work that we do. It's true. When you look at SPLC, you do strengthen intersectional movements to include directly impacted people's voices in the decision making process. Very well at the community at the capital level in DC, but now global civil society. And I think if you look at maybe some of the reports that you drafted you could agree that you were able to advance access to public policy and human rights of all people. Uh, thanks. I certainly hope so. I, you know, one of the things that we were most pleased to be able to do um, in this particular review, which is the first one that we have really fully participated in, was to bring directly impacted people uh, with us to Geneva to talk directly to the committee about their experiences. Um, we've had uh, formerly incarcerated people from uh, the Southeast who, who came to tell the committee about their experiences with prison labor, with solitary confinement in U.S. prisons, uh, with felon dis disenfranchisement, um, voting voter suppression in the United States. So for, for us, the ability for these international mechanisms to be able to hear directly from the people who the issues they're reviewing are affecting their daily lives this is very, very important. And you definitely went beyond the national border to the world board of public opinion. What were some of the steps you did to prepare for the August 11, 12th review before you got on the ground in Geneva? Well, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm focused on um, taking the work that other 
parts of SPLC are doing and and then turning those um, the context, you know, to the context of international advocacy. So the first thing I needed to do was really look at who are the clients we're representing in the areas that are going to be reviewed by the CERD? I, I, you know, knowing what's in the treaty, what are we doing and who are we representing who are being impacted by those areas? And how can I then present those issues to the CERD in a report or actually in our case, three reports that we submitted to the CERD um, in, in a way? And you have to do it in a concise, concise way because there are pretty strict page limitations on the amount of information you can provide. Um, but the committee really relies on organizations like SPLC and others to provide this information because, as you said, it's an 18-member body. These are people who are all, almost all of them not from the United States. So they're relying on us to tell them what's really happening here. They have a report from the United States, but they need to hear from civil society organizations what's really happening on the ground. And so that's our job. That's a really good summary because when you look at it, what does happen is prior to arriving in Geneva, as you said, the U.S. government writes its report. And of course, it's usually glowing and how good and how many resources are being dedicated. And then, as you said, civil society, in this case, SPLC drafted three reports. And then it's getting those documents to them. And that's when the real work sort of begins. After we do draft those, we then arrive in Geneva in August. And what was it like? What were your first impressions of that exciting week concluding with the actual uh, reviews on the 11th and the 12th? Um, you know, the, the first thing that really, really impressed me was that there were so many organizations from the U.S. who showed up in Geneva to see the committee and to tell them what was really happening. Uh, you know, I've, I've been involved in, in international advocacy before um, working with other organizations before I joined SPLC, and I had never seen that level of engagement from civil society organizations. So just I was really blown away by the number of, of organizations that were there and also the, the collaborative way that they worked. We all worked to make sure that we use the very limited time that's available with the committee to, to make the best and most effective presentation of all the many issues that we raised. Because, um, you know, while SPLC had a number of issues, voting rights, decarceration, some education issues, rights of migrants, um, and, and a number of others, there were indigenous rights organizations, there were reproductive rights organizations, there were organizations raising many different issues. And we had to make sure that we effectively presented all of that to the committee in a pretty short period of time that was available to us to brief them. Um, and for our, many of us brought directly impacted people with us and for those people to get a chance to speak. And it's true. When you look at it, we arrived there on Sunday. On Sunday is the first time most people got to see each other in mm -hmm. person due to COVID, but also because we work all across the country. And then on Sunday, breaking up into those small working groups that then we're trying to come up with drafting the language and then agreeing to limit their own time and making sure that we mm -hmm. share that window. Because as you said, everybody met on Sunday, but then on Tuesday was the first time that we really had two and a half hours to be able to speak directly to those 18 members, but also even include the voices from people back home that were Zooming in. So. We really look at a two hours and a half time period with roughly eight dozen civil society representing directly impacted peoples and amazing advocates to try to share specifically what's going on in the country and also give the questions and recommendations of what these 18 experts should concentrate on. And that's what I think you really summarize it so well is there could be a sense of competition but really collaboration and cooperation was what dominated the day and prevailed throughout the entire week. And one of the stories that really touched me the most was when we shifted from indigenous in the first part to then featuring uh, Terrence. Maybe you could say why his story was so powerful. And it really was the eyes of the world focusing on fundamental freedoms in the US. Yeah, absolutely. So. One of the three reports that, that SPLC worked on was a coalition report of a number of organizations that represent incarcerated people in the Southeast. And um, 
one of those organizations, uh, Promise of Justice Initiative from Louisiana, introduced me to Terrence Wynn, who was um, incarcerated in Angola prison in Louisiana when he was a teenager and served 30 years at Angola. Uh, and he was released just a couple of years ago. But And, and since then, um, he has actually started his own nonprofit organization in Shreveport, Louisiana, where he is um, encouraging youth, you know, to to um, better their lives and make sure that they don't wind up where he was. He's in working on behalf of um, wrongfully incarcerated people and doing a lot of wonderful work. So um, Terrence was able to go with us to Geneva and to tell his story. And as you mentioned in that preparation part, you know, we all had to work together very carefully to to have. Um, just a couple of minutes to speak. And Terrence, um, you know, having never been in a position like that before, did a wonderful job of, of, you know, telling his whole story in two and a half minutes to these committee members. And he talked about how um, when he went to Angola at age 17, um, the very first thing he was required to do as a job assignment was to pick cotton. And he was, you know, overseen by, you know, armed white men on horseback. And it was very, he said, you know, I, I went from learning about slavery in my history books in school to literally being a slave. And uh, he, he said that, you know, he just couldn't bring himself to participate in that. And so he refused and was put in solitary confinement and, and sometimes put in solitary confinement for very long periods of time. And, uh, you know, I thought, he did such a powerful job of, of speaking that truth and people were really moved and the committee members were really moved by hearing, you know, I put it, I could put those, that information in a report, but hearing it directly from the person who lived it is a whole different thing. And, it, and it's so powerful because you wouldn't think to say you have two minutes, two and a half minutes to tell your story. That's a story and that you could convey that, but Terrence did an amazing job and there was everyone in the room's attention was captivated. And yeah. he summarized it so sincerely and described what he went through and touched on all the issues, the prison to pipeline, how it's continuing, that aspect of solitary confinement, which many UN instruments is very concerned about in our country. But then also it's talking about where we need to go and how we should go forward with specific questions to pose to the US government, but also those recommendations as well. Yeah, and I think, you know, when we, and I know we're going to talk a little bit later about what the recommendations were that were finally um, published today, but everything that Terrence said was very much reflected there. And and I think, you know, um, he's to be congratulated for that. Yeah, and that really then set the tone for our next two days where we were able to negotiate, as we were talking about earlier, uh, we we're on a small delegation with Jamil and they had offered to give us the Thursday afternoon. And we really thought that, that wouldn't work. Uh, we thought it would be too much work because the US civil society, but also the US government delegation with all the national agencies and departments was so big that we would not have enough time. So the able, ability to be able to diplomatically secure two breakfast briefings mm -hmm. was also quite significant. And I think that was also important. That was the Wednesday morning was the first breakfast briefing where people focusing on racial justice were able to once again reinforce that initial first meeting on Tuesday, and then also to dig deeper and, and meet and connect closer with the experts. Did you have any one-on-one -on -one interaction with the experts? And how'd you find those 18 experts in the process? Yeah, um, actually throughout the week, we were able to set up some meetings, not only with a couple of the committee members, but also with other UN mechanisms. So part of the really important part of being on the ground in Geneva was um, that flexibility to, to find people and, and meet with them about our issues. So for example, we met with people who uh, work with the Special Rapporteur on Racism. We met with uh, people who work for the working group of experts on people of African descent um, and a number of other mechanisms. So there was just lots of opportunities to make sure that all of the information that we put in our reports and all of the information that our, our um, directly impacted colleagues had to share 
was shared with as many people as possible. And all of them, uh, committee members and other mechanisms were very receptive, very, very happy to be able to get this information because as I said, they all do rely on us to bring it to them. Um, you know, they just can't, you know, sometimes they can make a country visit. Um, some mechanisms can come and, you know, make a short visit to the country, but even, even then, um, there's a very limited amount that they can garner. So um, to, to get that information from organizations like ours is, is um, allows them to do their jobs. And it's true, it's tomorrow be the day of African descent happening. And we know that the intersectionality of all the issues was really brought up and raised well. We know the independent expert on sexual orientation and gender identity is just wrapping up a visit to the United States where it went to Alabama and many places that is quite brave and making sure that we push this human rights framework on how we look at public policy going forward. And I think that came out really well also in the consultation when the US government hosted uh, the civil society mm -hmm. at the US mission. I don't know if you had any reflections on that or aspects, but I know it did shift in many ways the mm -hmm. position of the US government from the way they were approaching interacting with civil society. Yeah, you know, I think it's important to, to note, first of all, that the U.S. government had been conducting these this series of consultation meetings with civil society leading up to uh, everyone going to Geneva. It had been going on for a couple of months, and we'd had a number of hour or two hour meetings focused on different topics that were likely to come up during the review. Um, and while I have to say that, you know, I certainly think that the Biden administration's approach to human rights is, you know, a sea change from the previous administration and so much more desirable. And I do think that the Biden administration's intentions in this area are very good. Um, the execution has sometimes been a little lacking. And um, these consultations that we've had um, before the trip to Geneva had been um, often felt like form over substance. There'd been not, not nearly enough substance coming from the U.S. Um, agencies who participated and, you know, it felt like we were feeding them information to help them prepare that they weren't really giving a whole lot back. So we really had hoped, and some, some of us organizations had expressed the administration writing that we hoped that there would be more substantive interaction in Geneva. Uh, so we went there with that hope. Uh, we went to this um, final consultation session at the U.S. mission. It's a very large delegation with representatives from many different agencies, from the State Department, from the White House, although I have to say not from the Domestic Policy Council, the White House, only only foreign policy, which, you know, we're, we're talking about domestic implementation of a treaty, not foreign policy. So that was a little disappointing. Um, but, it, you know, this this consultation really for most of the time we were there was kind of the same thing. There was, a, you know, some very sort of top level general statements about different issues arising under the treaty, but really no commitments about what they were going to do about it. Really not very much specific. Um, and so it, it really felt, you know, kind of let down. Um, in a way, but at some point very late in the meeting, some of the groups, um, and I in particular want to thank, you know, the indigenous rights organizations, the reproductive rights organizations who um, really just honestly had had enough and, um, and said, and, you know, what, what I'm saying that, you know, this is not, this is not acceptable. It's not sufficient. It's not getting us anywhere. Um, you know, we're all spinning our wheels and, and we're very, very disappointed. And really some of the U.S. delegation appeared to have been very affected by it. Um, and that was in really when we went to the formal review and the U.S. began to make their presentation. Some of that came out from some of the delegation members who said, you know, we heard you yesterday and we, you know, we're going to do better and we know we have to do better. So I hope that sticks. I agree. Those lead up consultations, usually early mornings here in Hawaii, were just 
seemed, as you said, sort of performative. Mm -hmm. And what was quite crucial was, as you did say, the meeting at the mission, it was from three to five is when it was scheduled. But then sort of from five to 6.30, that last 90 minutes, I agree, there was a breakthrough. And it was reproductive rights, saying we are here, we are partners, we should be trusted. It was the sharing by the activists from Chicago saying the caskets are getting smaller and smaller, but I'm still doing voter registration drives and we have to do more. Don't send me home with empty buckets. And as you did say, it was indigenous. It was Western Shoshone Defense Project saying, think and do the right thing. Think of Mother Earth. Think about the long-term consequences of what's going on. And there was a shift. You could see Department of Labor starting to tear up. You could see Health and Human Services you could see the global envoy. You could see even the new ambassador saying that we've got to do things in a different way. And that carried over. I agree with you. Even at the spiritual service that we had outside by the Serpentine Cafe, it was not only civil society meeting there for that spiritual ceremony, but also Department of Interior joined. And so did a handful of others. So that did carry over. And we did hear the opening comments on August 11th, and you could hear a change. We know that State Department had to do a lot of writing that night to change what they were about to say. And one last point, I definitely agree with you, is National Security Council always said to take such a prominent role, but it should have really been other agencies, even though there's a great broad section of the important cabinet offices there should be a different focus that looks at human rights as a domestic really way to go forward in our decision making processes. Right. And I mean, I think, you know, the presence there or the absence of the people that you really would have wanted is really reflective of something that's been going on in the U.S. for a very long time, which is that, you know, the, the U.S. signs and ratifies some of these treaties, not all of them, but some of them. And but then it doesn't give them any field of operation. You know, Congress never passes any laws that incorporates them into domestic law. And then administrations, successive ones, and not just the Trump administration, you know, the Obama administration, the Biden administration, um, doesn't take any steps to incorporate them into its domestic policy. And a good example of that that we have raised throughout these consultations and um, in our reports to the UN CERT committee was that the Biden administration, President Biden issued a racial equity executive order that um, required agencies to undertake a pretty sweeping review of their uh, policies and procedures and look at racial equity issues and to come up with a strategic plan to advance racial equity which is great. And I, I have no criticism of, of that except for this. None of them, not neither the order nor any of the plans, made any mention of the treaty on racial discrimination. And, you know, um, if that's not a golden opportunity to incorporate uh, international human rights obligations, a treaty that has been signed by the U.S. into some kind of domestic policy in the U.S., I don't know what is. Uh, and it was just like, they didn't even think of it. And now, you know, at, and after the fact, when you say, well, why didn't you do this? You don't even get an answer. Um, and so that's, you know, it's always an afterthought and compliance is always just sort of a coincidence. You know, something happened that sounds like it complies. So we'll check that box. But there needs to be much more intentional efforts to comply. And that's what we're really hoping for. It's true, the intentionality and the intersectionality really came across from civil society. And from the government side, it was a coinky dink or a wow, that would have been good. And I think mm -hmm. that came through by the CERD members' questions, yes. by the recommendations. Through that six hours, you could see them starting to say, it's not enough, it must be more. And to really start institutionalizing with maybe a standing uh, group of these agencies, the interagency standing task force or a national human rights institution, mm -hmm. you could see CERD saying, do better and do it well. Coordinate this on the country level. And some of the recommendations we can see 
at least the direction of how the Biden administration, but also the U.S. government, no matter who's in the White House, should be taking steps. And I think voting rights, as well as prison, building on what you shared earlier with Terrence's story, and education issues. Maybe you could share some of those recommendations and how those were positive as we go forward. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's really, if people want to look at these recommendations, I, I think people should look at them. Um, I wish more people realized that, you know, they even have international human rights that they're entitled to rely on. Um, and they, they, they should look at what these UN bodies are recommending. But it's important to know that, the, you know, this is a diplomatic institution and they speak in diplomatic language. So, you know, what sounds like, you know, not necessarily really sharp language might be, for example, in a number of cases, both during the questioning by the committee members and also in the conclusion, written conclusions and recommendations, the committee said that it regretted, um, you know, the, the responses from the U.S. In diplomatic terms, regret is a big deal. Um, you know, you don't regret something that's really bad. And so, you know, for, for the, the third to say that it regretted the lack of, of substantive information that was that was provided or that it regretted the lack of progress, um, that was really, you know, really saying that there was a serious deficit. It's true. And when you look at the recommendations and the language that did come out today, what would you say would be some of the most important initiatives that could be taken up that we might be able to inform and influence the institutions of the U.S.? Well, as I, as I said, um, you know, I do think that some of the most important things that the committee said were about this overarching uh, need to incorporate the obligations of the treaty in what the government does, because it just has failed to do that. And um, during the questioning, one of the White House representatives did say to the committee that the White House would consider studying um, the possibility of setting up a national human rights institution or some si similar mechanism to coordinate uh, and monitor implementation of the treaty. And that was very different from what that same person had said, you know, during pre review consultations with civil society. So I really hope there's an opening there for us to push the administration um, to, to do something that, that actually brings some cohesiveness, uh, some intention to its efforts to comply with this and other treaties. Um, I, I think that's a really big deal and something that we can, we can make progress on. Um, another, go ahead, sorry. No, please continue. I was just going to say another thing that, that I found in particular, you know, Southern Poverty Law Center, one of um, our biggest areas of work is combating hate and extremism. And we, you know, we monitor um, the activities of hate, white supremacist groups, anti-government groups across the country. And um, the committee's concerns about the prevalence of hate speech, including hate speech by public officials and politicians uh, and the rise of hate crimes and the increased activity of white supremacists and other hate groups. Um, I, I appreciated that, that they placed such emphasis on that. Um, the recommendations that they made um, specifically addressed the fact that reporting of hate crimes to the FBI by law enforcement agencies is voluntary and there's just terrible underreporting. So really we don't even have good data on the number of hate crimes, who the victims of these hate crimes are across the country, because so many law enforcement agencies just don't even report it. And you can't, you know, you can't really act on what you don't know. And so it's very, very important. Um, we had recommended in our report, and the committee actually echoed this, um, that the government, the federal government should do whatever it can to require law enforcement agencies to to do this reporting. And, you know, the, the U.S. government is very good at saying, well, you know, this is the states. We, we don't control the states. We can't make them do. But you know what the government has that it can use to good effect when it decides to do so is money. 
and we have always um, encouraged you in um, you know, mechanisms to, to use funding as either carrot or stick. And um, I, I was pleased to see the committee recommend that as well. No, it was a very thorough six hours. But as you said, sometimes what the uh, 18 experts said or didn't say and how they said it just spoke volumes of how much further we have to go in the United States to really recommend, but more importantly, realize the Universal Declaration of Human Rights crafted by Eleanor Roosevelt and make sure that decades later, people can have that fundamental inherent dignity in their daily lives. And we thank the Southern Poverty Law Center for your work in bringing this to the UN. And we look forward to focus on the implementation in the next phase as we focus on these recommendations going forward. Thank you. It's so great to work with you and look forward to doing more in the future. Mahalo, thank you so much. And we look forward to making sure that the decade of African descent becomes a genuine space where we focus on social justice, but also to use all the UN human rights systems from the Universal Periodic Review to all the Human Rights Council special procedures as well. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.